Hey, Vanessa. Hey, Adam. Welcome to Uncertain Things, the podcast. Do we need a tagline? Like, welcome to Uncertain Things, the podcast that's going to stretch for two hours. Well, yeah, I've gotten feedback that it is excellent material for for cross-country road trips. Uh, Appropriately, Um, I got feedback recently that said, why can't you be more like the daily? Oh, man, if that's what you're looking for, I think, I don't know why you're with us. (laughs) Uh, but I guess to to the pleasure of the people who levied the criticism, w- we actually have a pretty short interview. That's true. Not by design, but by reality constraints. We had the pleasure of interviewing Representative Peter Meyer, the freshman congressman, Republican congressman, I should say, a Michigander, a state that I have a personal, let's call it something between affinity and affiliation, crazy state, um, and, and who has made a made of herself for... Standing up to his own party. In fact, it was just a couple of days after being sworn in that the January 6th uh, insurrection, riot, attack on the Capitol, the uh, uh, visitor t- tour gone awry, whatever partisan moniker you want to give it, occurred. And unlike many of his Republican colleagues, he firmly and unequivocally blamed Trump. Not just for the uh, speech that he gave immediately preceding the attack, but for the months-long attempt by the Trump campaign to delegitimize the election and and plant the narrative that should Trump lose, it would be only due to voter fraud and and some democratic malfeasance. Which, if if taken at face value, as we've discussed with Sarah Isger in, in our previous episode calls upon effectively every warm-blooded patriot to march upon the Capitol and prevent the certification of the stolen election. So Peter Mayer, who I should say during his run for office, was accused of being too Trumpy by his opponents, very quickly zeroed in on Trump as the culprit and voted to impeach him. And as listeners and basically any sentient being should know by now, Voting against your own party guru these days is essentially bucking the trend of the current crop of Republicans. So in the immediate aftermath, it gave many interviews, including to, by the way, The Daily. That conversation with The Daily was like right after January 6th. And so it was like so fresh. And you can kind of hear the evolution in his both thinking and his emotions, if you listen to this interview, of like what it's like now, you know, eight months later. And realizing that eight months later, we're basic factual observations about what happened January 6th have become beyond the pale for many uh, on, on the right. And sure, there is some exploitation on the left as well for political purposes. But on the right, it seems to be going beyond the pale to suggest that the riot with all its decorative Trump paraphernalia was orchestrated by Trump supporters or that Trump bears some responsibility by sowing doubt in the democratic process. And this is without even getting into value judgment, where we seem to have fractured into completely separate epistemic universes. So yeah, that's one of the reasons we've definitely wanted to talk to the congressman. And it's worth noting, we don't normally bring politicians to uncertain things. We don't, we don't think that the people of politics uh, need more soapboxes to stand on. But Peter Meyer's perspective as somebody who's refusing to fully lean into the culture war the way that his colleagues from the right and the left uh, seem committed to do, gives him what I, I think is an incredibly valuable perspective on the deep corrosion of American Congress and government from within. Plus, it's a distressing account as to just how thoroughly destructive this current state of rampant cultural war, tribalism, and cultism is to, to just functioning of government which conversely highlights the absence of adults willing to even try to curb 
that trend. Right. And and what we, we also talk about the fact that it's not just that people are in tribes, it's like they're in different realities. And I think what's part, partly what's so interesting about him actually having been there on the floor on January 6th is that he has a firsthand account of what happened. And so when constituents call him up and say, like, this isn't like this happened and the other thing happened and it was a conspiracy and the other and he said, well, I was there and it wasn't like that. And so he's kind of he has this this real firsthand experience of the ways that people are perceiving current events in such distorted ways and creating new stories in their minds. And and so he has January 6th to refer to that. But now he sees he can see it like replicating in all kinds of other situations. And even if he doesn't have firsthand experience, he has a sense of, wow, like certain people are are living in an entirely different reality. And how do we how do we bring those folks back so we can actually have conversations about my platform or like policy or things like that like that's what he's very much stuck in that rut it feels like and in that sense this interview kind of works as an interesting sequel to our conversation with sarah isger which i recommend we're listening to anyway besides culture war i wanted to get a little bit on the aumf the authorization of use of military force which is the congressional bills that have empowered the president to act militarily around the world, which Meyer has uh, voted to repeal. He's a veteran of the American military, and I was incredibly interested in hearing his thoughts as views about the the global role of the U.S. militarily or otherwise have been changing. I, I was really r- curious to hear his vision for uh, American interventionism or lack thereof. So I have, I have bigger questions to ask you, Vanessa, but we'll leave that for uh, a different episode. A longer one <laughs> where people are in for the long haul. <laughs> exactly. But for now, uh, follow us on uncertain.substack.com or wherever you get your podcasts. We are UncertainPod on the Twitters and... If you feel like supporting us, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us reach more people. So thank you. Last warning, I recorded this podcast while I was still in Jerusalem in my mom's house, to be exact. And for this reason, it sounds like I've recorded the episode in Winston Churchill's bunker. So apologies. All right. Well, with that, Peter Meyer. Hello, hello. Hello. Congressman. Welcome. Great suit. Thank you. It's it's just a it's just a jacket. I, if this was a suit, it would be pretty, uh, pretty slick. Checkered slacks would have been amazing. <laughs> so, Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. I don't know how much you know about our show. We discussed it a bit previously, but Vanessa and I both come from different experiences in media, and we've had our own insight into the way partisanship gets. Uh, pushed and distributed. And I think one of the things that motivated us in creating uncertain things is to highlight people who defy those partisan boundaries. And usually that has put us off from talking to politicians because, you know, it's the job of a politician to perpetuate them usually. But in your year as a a congressman, you have become somewhat of an icon in being able to talk back to your own tribe. So with that in mind, how are you feeling in your position as a Republican congressman? Um, thank you for having me on. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I would say uncertain. Um, I'm, I'm not there. I, I don't, I did not enter politics in order to stand up on a soapbox and, and, you know, scream and shout. I do not doubt that I could do that and I could be very good at it. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I got involved in order to hopefully drive forward good policy. Uh, I, there, I would love to be spending all of my time criticizing just terrible democratic policies that are leading the country astray and offering better alternatives. Um, it's hard to get at my, you know, frustrations with certain parts of the tax code that are are biased towards. Um, yeah, I, I know, <laughs> Vanessa. I know you're you're coming from New York. I think the state and local tax deduction is a, an abomination. 
right? There are many ways in which I think structurally, I, I worry about the long-term financial solvency of this country. That's where I would love to be centering the conversation. Uh, but when I have, you know, folks coming up to me saying that I'm going to be shot for treason uh, and kind of individuals thirsting for civil war, it kind of becomes a more pressing priority. Um, now, looking at, at the, the media landscape, um, you know, obviously there's, there's the, the, the mainstream media, which I have a lot of, of frustrations with. But, you know, even when somebody comes to the absolute wrong conclusion, uh, it's usually at least in part predicated or, or assumed to be predicated on and have a factual basis um, versus some of the fever swamp areas that um, uh, you know, many try to stifle, um, but where a lot of folks find a sense of solace and meaning. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll dive a little bit more deeply into this, but, you know, it's really dispiriting to kind of see something online and know, oh, I'm going to need to figure out, you know, what happened with this Italian military satellite but I can't even, I can't, some of the hardest accusations to rebut are ones where you just do not know where to begin because there is no basis in fact. Um, the easiest ones are where you say, oh, okay, you thought it was this, but it was actually that, or well, this part of it is a little bit true. You know, there's a foundation, but, but here's where the conclusion is wrong. And when something is just spun out of whole cloth, I, I assume you're, I guess that's, that's, I assume you're mostly talking about the election doubts and conspiracy that's theories. become sort of the original sin from which um, all manner of, um, of uh, just lunacy has spun forth. And, and again, I would love to have a great conversation about some of the temporary modifications to our electoral processes done because of the pandemic that now many of which the Democrats are trying to make permanent um, you know, some of which may have increased participation without, um, you know, causing any additional risks, which fine. But at the same time, when you, you see how broken brains have gotten on both sides of the political spectrum, um, you know, the reaction to the, the, the Georgia voting laws on, on the left um, and, and seeing suppression around every corner, um, it, it, even in places where, I mean, the, the pivot that Stacey Abrams and, and Raphael Warnock made on voter ID over the span of three months where it went from being Jim Crow 2.0 to, well, we don't have a problem with that. It's like there, there's very little intellectual consistency um, and, and it's wrong. But when the other side is, is thinking that our ballots are, you know, inspecting the Arizona you know, audit folks, inspecting them for bamboo fibers and just coming up with fantastical stories about Green Berets and CIA special agents getting into gunfights at a server farm in Germany. And I mean, I, I yeah. I'm so I, so this, is, this, <laughs> goes to, this goes to, to, to uh, uh, something that troubles me. I, 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 I probably classify me as an independent, probably never thought of this category before moving to the U.S. It's not really uh, the language of Israelis, but um, I'm, I'm persuadable. Like I, I could be somebody that, that a Republican could come to me and tell me like, Hey, you live in New York. Taxes are too high. What are you getting for it? Like, maybe you should vote for us. Why aren't Republicans doing that? And why, why is, is it on the national, uh, the, the national picture of the Republican party right now seems to be completely abandoning the millions of people who are urbanites or who might very easily be, you know what, maybe I'm not co totally comfortable with some of the things that Democrats are doing. And instead, they seem completely bent on antagonizing anybody who doesn't fully subscribe to the theatrics of Trump world. Right. And not even necessarily urbanites, right? It's just anyone who could be persuadable. At right, this right. I mean, and, and I don't know if this makes me, if this makes me hopelessly naive, um, then I think we're in a really dangerous place. But I mean, I believe in persuasion I and mean, politics should be about persuasion, about saying, well, you know, their ideas are bad because of X, Y, and Z, and our ideas are bad because of ABC, right? I mean, offering that context. In order to do that, you need to be, you need to agree on, on a um, epistemological framework, right? I mean, have a shared ontology. You need to view the world in a similar way, Um to, to, to rebut the, whether or not one policy is going to work, you need, uh, you need to uh, have a, a, a logical through line, right? I mean, there needs to be this, this consistency to a worldview, not, not a perspective, right? But just 
like I'm, I'm touching my desk right now. Do we, or, or I'm, I'm touching my nose right now. We agree I'm touching my nose, right? I mean, like we need to come to that base understanding before we can proceed. Um, and that's where, uh, I mean, I, the, there, there are a couple of things that just, I, I have, I ask, I'm waiting for someone to explain to me the, the kind of the partisan benefit behind this, right? One, um, strenuously undercutting uh, confidence in the elections. I mean, that lost the Republicans, the Senate in Georgia. I mean, you look at the voter participation drop off. There is nothing that is just more incandescently stupid that a party can do than to tell its voters to stay home. Um, number two, a lot of the active promotion of misinformation around and then encouraging skepticism around COVID vaccines, um, like set, I, I often have to set aside morals, set aside values, set aside principles. Like I do not expect somebody to share mine. I hope that they do, but I, I can't expect that someone does. But the Republican Party, if you're looking at it from the most cravingly cynical standpoint, the Republican Party has probably lost net 100,000 voters because of COVID, right? And, and if everyone who's dying of COVID right now is not vaccinated, right? A party that wants, like, I don't know why our message isn't get the vaccine so you're, alive. so at the very least, right? If, if you are not going to do it because of a family or if you have concerns, talk to a doctor, but, but we as a party would encourage you to do this so you can be alive to vote in the midterm. Right. Like it, like the fact that that isn't even a subtext. Um, so, so you have those like intentional undermining of just your the, the, the willingness of your voters to come out and vote and their corporeal ability to cast a vote, undermining both of those. Uh, the only thing that really explains it is just this kind of race to the bottom to lock in the the fervent passion of a. Um, maybe a, not even probably a majority of the party, but if you have those that that sort of loyal, dedicated following, um, I mean, the only thing I can I can take away is that if if you're able, if you don't think it's possible to persuade, right, then coercion and intimidation are your only options, and you can coerce and intimidate through a really impassioned minority. Um, we saw that attempted on January 6th. Um, I think you, you see this on both sides of the aisle and in a far less you know, dramatic form on the left. But I mean, the way that um, the, the sort of intimidation on a variety of issues, you know, and I'm not equating January 6th with cancel culture, but it's that belief that if you can shout someone down and shut them up and you've won that argument, Right. The, it seems that the right is taking that to its darkest extreme um, by if you can make someone fear for their life, then, you know, you've won the argument. Right. Because they're not arguing anymore because they're afraid. I, I mean, I I would love to have someone tell me the rosier, more optimistic picture of why all of this is occurring uh, and what it's going towards. But um, I I. I tend to think I'm pretty imaginative and I can't come up with it. And I have asked this question to a number of folks and nobody has provided me with anything resembling an answer there. So, so for, from your intuition, it's that they've just persuasion is something that they've completely given up on. So I just want, I'm wondering is what is it that makes you more publicly alive to those problems and to the, um, um, to the places where the Republican party has, has given up on persuasion? What, or, or what, a politician, I assume, is driven by some incentives to to, to the speaking your in, in the name of your constituency. Is that that you feel that your constituency wants you to be more honest about these issues, or is it just something that you're not comfortable to play along with personally? Um, be the cost what it may. You know, I I don't know how else I could respond to this. Um, Maybe more like Jim Jordan. My baseline operating ethos has been it, it is an honor to is the highest honor of my life to, to serve the people of their district. And I hope to continue to do so. Um, you know, there are, I think there are plenty of costless gains in politics. 
right? There's plenty of, you know, pandering around the margins that is just an inevitable part where um, you may talk to somebody and, and they, uh, they may push back a little bit and you say, well, I mean, okay, I could, I could maybe see where you're coming from there. I'm not entirely in agreement, but um, if we're 90% on the same page, I'm not going to rebut the other 10%. And, um, and, and a lot of that's just relations and, and a lot of that's life. Um, so there are a lot of costless, uh, you know, concessions that, that are made in politics because no one's going to be hundred percent. But when, when you see, I mean, a, without January 6th occurring, I mean, there, you could say, well, a lot of this is distasteful, but I think as one, one person said about, um, you know, sort of the, the election claims that uh, the former president was making, I mean, what, what's the harm, right? I mean, if we just do it. But we've seen the harm. And, and I'm not saying that January 6th was the worst thing that ever happened, but that should have been a strong wake-up call that we're really playing with fire here. Like, let's not get close to this again because um, we could stand to lose a tremendous amount in this country. And, and I very much view that as a, a, a turning point in terms of understanding that the intentional um, creation of doubt or, or um, you know, the, the sort of winking and nodding that a lot of politicians do, um, it has consequences, right? People take their cues from it. Um, I, I think there, it's important to know um, where folks stand on, on some of these key issues and, and know what they're willing to say, okay, enough, right? This is, we shouldn't continue down this line. Uh, I know I may have, um, you know, made, uh, you know, I, I think of the people who, well, of course, you know, I have concerns about election integrity too. Well, great. We talked earlier, right, about, you know, the expanded absentee, you know, ballots and some of the loosening restrictions because of the pandemic. Say that, don't make it seem like you agree that, Dominion voting machines were involved in some international conspiracy uh, uh, in, in an attack on our democracy of unprecedented scale. And you're just saying, well, yeah, like that, that is what I think is really created is this straddling of two worlds. Um, but I mean, it's just, it, it's not sustainable, right? It can't work in the long term. It'll either be the ruin of the Republican party or the continual damage to the country or both. And, and I don't think either is a prospect that we should be allowing, accepting, or, um, or staying silent. Yeah. I'd like to ask you a little bit about January 6th, only because it's, you know, it's been a while now. It's been about seven months. Um, and, and you were rather vocal in the immediate aftermath, I would say. And, and you've had, you know, seven months to not only personally reflect, but I think we've also kind of, as a, as a society, we've had a time for the narratives to kind of settle in, I guess, for the stories and maybe like the details starting to like fade away and kind of just the central stories to to solidify. But at the same time, it also seems like we're getting two separate stories potentially that are running in parallel to each other. Um, and I'm I'm just curious to to get your your take on this because you were talking earlier about like we lack an ontological framework to have conversations. Do you see this danger in having two narratives about this very pivotal moment in American history and, and having two segments of the country remembering it differently in a way that prevents us from kind of moving forward? A hundred percent. I mean, I think I mentioned, you know, the, the sort of elect the stolen election is that original sin. And, you know, if you believe that November 3rd, and again, this is where I think it's important to be precise in the definitions. Not that, you know, there were, um, you know, in our state of Michigan, the Secretary of State mailed out absentee ballot applications and she didn't have the authority to do that. It was illegal. Um, I mean, in that there wasn't a law permitting it. Um, and it was an improper use of funds. Uh, that's a very different complaint to lodge then it was a landslide victory for donald trump that was stolen right and so if you believe it was a landslide victory for donald trump that was stolen and that january 6th is the last effort the last gasp in order to um right this horrendous wrong um 
I mean, wouldn't you be authorized to use every means at your disposal to prevent this attack on the democracy, right? I mean, it's so it's the creation of this justifying framework. And, and on the 6th, I mean, what we saw shortly thereafter, I mean, I got a call from a constituent um, the night of the 6th, probably smartly anticipating that it wasn't something that reflected well on the Republican Party or on Donald Trump, who said, well, let's not blow things out of proportion, right? A few windows were broken. And I um, was back in the, the I was in the, the chamber when uh, we had to flee. Um, and then I was walking back to the chamber and would just had gotten into the gallery when I got a call from him. Um, and I, it took me a lot of strength and, and discipline to not uh, utter profanities in that you know sacred space. Um, I said, you know, when I was walking back here, the elevator I normally take, I've been there all of 72 hours, but the one that I knew to take because it was the closest, um, you know, a Capitol Police officer stopped me because there was, they were still cleaning up Ashley Babbitt's blood, you know, outside that elevator door. It was an act of crime scene, right? Like the, so you immediately saw this effort to downplay what had happened. And then when it was pretty evident, you couldn't downplay it. Um, it was, well, let's try to spin it in the most, you know, possible framework. So it went from January 6th wasn't bad to it was bad, but it was Antifa. That's what Matt Gates said on the floor later that night to it was bad, but, um, you know, it, because um, parts of it had been planned ahead of time, then they couldn't have been incited by Donald Trump's speech, you know, uh, but acknowledging it was bad to, well, it was bad, but it was, you know, the FBI. I mean, you just see this, this continual churn of that narrative. And I've talked to a lot of folks, and, and I'm firmly uh, in respect, you know, those who come, came to a different conclusion on the question of impeachment. Um, and, and even, okay, we can, we can have debates about the degree of culpability that Donald Trump has in terms of kind of creating that narrative that, that inspired so many people who thought they were doing what he wanted them to do. Um, but when it goes to the, to the extent of just, I mean, I, I had one constituent who told me, well, there were only the, the Capitol Police let them in, right? And that, so they were, they were in on it too. And then one constituent said, well, there were only three Capitol Police there that day. It's like, no. Like, and she kept insisting and insisting and insisting on, I was there, right? I know you talked to your friend who talked to your friend, or I know you read something online. Like, it's, it's this weird way where uh, it's this emotional straw grasping for folks who have gotten into this, this incredibly uncritical mindset where um, anything that challenges that, uh, if you can find the thinnest read, you know, to kind of get away from um, assuming responsibility, you take it. And then I think, uh, again, if, if I thought that January 6th was an isolated incident and that it was something that we learned all the right lessons from, would make sure we never let something like that happen again, or that, you know, there was this acknowledgement that, oh, okay, we went too far and we should, you know, back off if I thought that was the case and I probably wouldn't be as vocal uh, and exasperated today as I am. But it's absolutely not the case. And I don't think it's the last political violence we're going to see. And again, setting aside morals and principles and values, I do not understand why even the most cravenly cynical political operative isn't saying, hey, this might not be good for our electoral success down the line. Mm -hmm. Now in, in July, I mean, how what is it like being in Congress right now? I mean, like I said, time has passed. Um, but I mean, what is the atmosphere that you, how would you describe it today as opposed to, you know, when you started? And I'll also add, when the cameras are off and people are no longer speaking to their constituencies and the theatrics are tampered down, do you still feel this ontological rift with your colleagues? Oh, not with many. Um, you know, I, I think if, if, you know, you didn't ask me this question, but I mean, if it's the question of how many Republicans in the House actually believe that, you know, it was a landslide victory for Donald Trump that was stolen. I mean, I could probably count them on one hand. Um, but the amount who are willing to say that Joe Biden won the election uh, is probably less than a third. Right? And then everyone in between would say something like, well, you know, nobody's arguing that Joe Biden isn't the president. Well, you didn't answer the question, you know. You, um, but there's a but you, you, 
Yeah. No, sorry. sorry though, but I'm just wondering about the subcategory of like, okay, okay, sure. They understand that Joe Biden is the president, but you can convince yourself more easily that January 6th was not a real problem or is not symptomatic of something more dangerous to come. And I wonder about how in, in talking to people, when you're expressing so passionately your concerns about what it pretends to the Republic and, and to, to the Republican party specifically, do they, do your colleagues hear you? Yes. Yeah, no, they absolutely do. And, and I think the, the biggest challenge right now is, um, I mean, I would say the majority I've spoken to agree, right? I mean, and, and again, the, the, there are those who view the encouraging the, the kind of stop the steal um, uh, as being individually beneficial to their political prospects, right? It helps you get name ID and fundraising and, uh, and you build your public profile and you get these, you know, adoring fans. Um, you know, it's really beneficial. And you not only do you get fans, but you avoid falling on the opposite end of them of, of getting their wrath and getting primary challengers. Um, I mean, you, people want to coddle the crazy, right? You, you don't want the crazy coming after you. You'd rather them think you're on their side and then do what you can to once you've earned their trust kind of get enough distance where you don't lose everybody else. Um, I would say that's, you know, on an individual basis, that's um, uh, what folks are doing. But I mean, I think of the certification vote itself, um, you know, I think on an individual basis, you can justify, you know, lodging a complaint and an objection against electoral college certification. I mean, it'd been something that many Democrats had done in the past as well. You know, it wasn't what the individual votes were, it is what it in is it what it was in the aggregate. And in the aggregate, it was an attempt to overturn the election. Now, were any individuals saying that in terms of their justification? And is that what you know some of them believed? I don't believe so. Um, but that's what it, it became on the whole. Or that was how it was viewed and read, I mean, by, frankly, Donald Trump, um, who thought that this would work. And I mean, the, let me be very clear, this was communicated to me prior to the 6th that, you know, listen, we, we all know this is going to fail, but he doesn't. So, I mean, just humor him this one last time. Um, and I remember going into that certification and saying, uh, this seems different, right? This, this seems a little bit more dangerous. I know we've gotten into this world where we're only viewing it on how um, the president's, the former president's fan base is receiving it. And we're letting that set the framework. Um, but, you know, there's more to the country than the people who show up at his rallies. I mean, that's, that's a large constituency, um, but it's not, it wasn't enough to win the presidency in 2020. It wasn't enough to keep the house in 2018 and it wasn't enough to keep the Senate in 2021. So there are plenty of folks who see the challenge there and agree. Um, I mean, I, some may view me as being, you know, too much of a Cassandra on the possibility for future political violence, but also as one of the 10 Republicans who voted to impeach. Um, I am hearing from a lot of folks that maybe some of my colleagues aren't. But I think everyone acknowledges this problem. It's just uh, there's a, a collective action issue in terms of engaging with it. And, you know, there is, if you're the one to stick your head against the pair above the parapet, you know, you're going to take that bullet. And so there's not a, a benefit to doing it. And it's kind of a hope that, you know, well, this will fade. Donald Trump will go away. Um, I think anyone who believes that there will be a reversion to a positive status quo through an action doesn't appreciate the fact that there are people actively pushing forward so much of this garbage um, and, and so much of the online fever swamp, A, has a much larger constituency than I think a lot of folks appreciate, and B, it is engaged. So... Adam knows this firsthand. He, he did a he had a startup where he it, that kind of pivoted to kind of pander to that audience more, and it was I mean that's when I had to leave the startup. Left. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to also ask you about the AUMFs, the authorization of use of military force. You voted to revoke it. Now you've obviously served in the military for a number of years. You, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you've joined up. At a time where, where general perspective in America, um, the, the view of the role of the military and the role of America in the world was just about starting to pivot. 
And we're at a very different time right now in terms of, of, of the, the term perpetual war, this Gore Vidalian term is, <laughs> has now been popularized by Donald Trump. And, and you can hear Ch- the, the echoes of Chomsky on the right and the left. And it's, it's really interesting to have the whole country basically revisit what American imperialism looks like. And I wonder what your thoughts about this are. Because I assume revoking the AUMF is first and foremost about getting rid of, of too much imperial presidency, which, which I think probably we're on the same page on. But I wonder how that fits in, in your grander view of what America's role is right now internationally. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think we should be engaged, but I, I spent time as a combatant in Iraq. Uh, I was a non-combatant work for an aid organization in Afghanistan. Our military is not well equipped, well, is incapable of solving uh, problems that are inherently political of their origin. I mean, those need a political resolution. Um, So we should not be leaning with a military first foreign policy. It should be a last resort, not a first. Uh, We need to much, we need to remember that the intelligence community was intended to provide information uh, to policymakers, right? And, And make sure that that we, we increase our awareness and our understanding and have a State Department that, you know, right now our State Department is feckless and it is um, incredibly uh, risk averse and, uh, you know, will choose to do nothing if that's an option. Um, and that is most of what it does just about everywhere. So, I mean, it prizes itself on formality and bureaucracy rather than on accomplishing the mission that the American people should expect of it. So I, I think we need to have a strong revision of how, um, what that overlay is between intelligence, diplomacy, and defense. Um, I am a, I'm pro engagement, you know, but if our engagement is we find a few countries to bomb and invade and focus all attention there and then ignore everywhere else, uh, we are really shooting ourselves in the foot in the long term. I just got back from a, a trip to South Korea, and it's interesting and, and, and humbling visiting a country that literally wouldn't exist without the United States and or wouldn't have existed without the United States and continues to exist because of the United States. Right? There are plenty of ways in which our positive engagement in the world is incredibly helpful, um, but we also need to recognize that our sort of attention deficit foreign policy approach, where we have our largest embassies in Baghdad and in Kabul, um, it just not only distracts us from incredibly important engagement around the world, uh, but also gets us into this trap of always focusing on the war we're fighting, the war we fought, rather than trying to prevent the war that we may have to fight, you know, if we don't do what we need to do today. To um, So, so your, the idea is more, not just to re-empower Congress in in, in ca- thinking what deserves use of military force, but also to just give more power to the State Department and, and, and actually develop a more cohesive international approach? Or, I mean, a lot, a lot of this is not going to be legislated, um, but it, it will probably require some reforms and, and really a rethinking of how that, that apparatus is. But as long as we're stuck in the wars we are in today, uh, that will always be the more pressing issue. So part of this is right-sizing congressional authorization and congressional agency um, and, and reprising their constitutional responsibilities. You know, part of it is dealing with the conflicts as they are. And then part of the, the broader challenge, and this will be a generational challenge, is finding a better balance in the world that isn't just predicated on having an enemy um, uh, and, and focusing on that against all else, but communicating why it's good for the U.S. to have global stability um, and that you know, stability doesn't necessarily mean propping up a tin pot dictator uh, because that guy will probably get, you know, you know, bayoneted on the side of the road after a minute and then there's going to be anarchy again. So you want to have things that are sustainable within the populations that they're representing, you know, recognizing that we don't know we're, we're still figuring out the best way to govern ourselves. And so we should be a little bit humble in terms of extending that too far, um, but that we should be engaged and in ways that promote long-term stability rather than just taking what we can get while we can get it and then um, forgetting everything else. Well, I, I have a million questions to ask you about this, but I, I see that you, we're, we're out of time. So I just want to ask you before you go, um, the question we, we try to ask everyone, like, what do you see? And I'm particularly interested in your thoughts on this. What do you see as the blind spots on the left? And what do you see as the blind spots on the right right now that are most pernicious? I think the blind spot on the left is definitely the way in which 
um, you know, Twitter culture dominates above all else. I mean, I, the New York City mayoral race was a great indication of this where, um, you know, there's more to life than, than what folks are talking about on Twitter. And on the right, it's that uh, there are really two worlds there. I mean, they, it, there are the people who are grounded in reality and then there are people who are, who are living in fantasy. Um, and that those two um, are going to be very hard to straddle. It's going to be a long project to bring people back to um, some semblance of rationality. But the biggest challenge there is just um, how active that world is being propped up because there's a lot of money to be made there. I mean, Donald Trump's low dollar fundraising base is one of the most incredible political machines that's been invented in modern history. And that is something that no party wants to give up. Um, and frankly, the fact that there's a lot of people who make more money and are advantaged, not off of uh, winning elections, winning majorities and pushing forward their agenda, um, but off of ensuring their own career survival and prosperity. So, um, I, you know, we bono, know, right? Who benefits? Always a good thing to remember. Thank you, Congressman. Right. Well, it's thank been an you, honor talking to you. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you for listening to Uncertain Things. Follow us on uncertain.substack.com or wherever you get your podcasts. We are Uncertain Pod on the social media. And if you're so inclined, please give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. Share us with your friends and enemies. And until next time, stay sane.